quiet silence of a heart that believes itself defeated by loss, by pain, by fear. Our hope nailed to a cross, our own faith depleted at the sight of no movement, a body inert. But it is not the end. At the sound of the gravestone rolling, a new story has unfolded. Death has been defeated. Our hope is alive. Jesus is alive. We raise our hands in victory. By his resurrection, we are set free. He blows a wind of life and brings us back to the light. He is risen. Our Messiah is alive. He breathes and the darkness trembles. He speaks and our future shines. By His sacrifice we are now saved. By His grace we can all rise. Here rejoicing in the sky. The grave could not hold Him. The veil has been torn. Our Christ has won. Over death, over sin, over ache. By His power all chains break. He is victorious. He is the way. He is the resurrection and the life. And by His wounds, we're made alive.
the darkest day in history. There on a cross they made for sinners. For every curse is blood it told. One final breath and then it was finished. But not the end. We have gathered here together today because Jesus, you.
conquered sin and death. And you didn't stay dead, but you rose victoriously from the grave. And because you are alive and because you are seated at the right hand of God the Father, we today, as your people, get to live in your presence, get to experience your tangible goodness amongst us, get to celebrate together that Jesus, the King of the world, the ruler of all things, is our friend and he's present amongst us. So today, Jesus, we give you our highest praise. We turn our hearts, our affection and attention to you alone because Jesus, you are the King of kings. And we thank you that you are alive and well and that you are with us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, I'm going to say be seated, but I know that doesn't mean everyone has a seat. So go ahead and be seated if you have one, and I'm going to make a bunch of seats available for you. So kids, if you are here today and you are in preschool, you can go ahead, parents, and start making your way to the back. I've got preschool teachers in the entryway ready for you out in the doorway. If you're here today, kids, and you are in kindergarten, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, or sixth grade out in the entryway. Your teachers are there holding signs, and you can make your way out to them. Now, since a hundred seats just opened up, it would do us a, a huge favor if you would scoot so that the seats that are now available aren't just like one in between, you and the person. So if you would scoot together, we've got a whole bunch of people who are still in the back and in the entryway that need to find a seat. So if you could scoot and then do me a huge favor, if you have three or four seats next to you, could you just hold up like the number of fingers that you have available? And then we're going to fill those in for you. All right, thank you, friends, for doing that for us. Welcome, everyone, to Silver Creek Fellowship. Welcome to Easter Sunday. There's a tradition that goes a long way back in the Christian church on Easter, and that is that I'm going to say he is risen. Wait, wait, when I say it, when I say the words, you're going to respond with he is risen indeed. Indeed. Not a word we use a lot anymore, but we're going to practice it, okay? So I'm going to say what I say, and you're going to respond he's risen indeed, okay? Here we go. He is risen he is risen. risen Amen. He has risen indeed. And we are so glad to have you with us to celebrate Easter Sunday today. This would be a great spot in our service for you to pull out your connection card and fill this out for us. Don't forget there's a spot on the back for your prayer requests and your answers to prayer. And then every single week we gather these together and we pray through each and every prayer request. So take the time and fill those out. We've got bins in the back and out in the entryway that you can drop those in on your way out today. Those are the same bins that if you came today and you have a tithe or an offering you'd like to make in person, you could put it there in those bins. If you consider this to be your home church family and you want to participate with us in the mission God's called us to in Silverton, um, you can do that by putting it in the bin. Or you can also do that in a bunch of other ways, by text, you can do it through our app, you can do it online. If you have any questions, our welcome center is out in the entryway. And you can stop by there and ask them any questions that you might have. Now, if you are new with us today, if this is your first time visiting Silver Creek Fellowship, we're so glad to have you with us on this Easter Sunday. And we actually have a gift for you out at the connect- at the Welcome Center as well. So stop by there on the way out, and we've got a little gift bag for you um, to just say thank you for joining us today. Now, I'm not going to make a bunch of announcements today because I want to jump in, but you will see in your bulletin one little flyer that we've printed up, and that is, I don't know if any of you have watched before, but we are going to start, not this Wednesday, but the following Wednesday on April 10th, we're going to start a study where we're going to watch together The Chosen, uh, the television program made about the life of Jesus and his disciples. On Wednesday night, we'll watch an episode and we'll have a discussion afterwards. So if you want to participate with us in that, that would be a great way for you, get to, for you to get to know 
uh, more about the life of Jesus and get to meet and get to know some people in a, in a new way. Also, on the back of that little handout, it talks about our next sermon series. And so next week, I'll be starting a new series that actually picks the story up where we're going to leave off today. Because you might have the question, well, what did this resurrection of Jesus, what did it accomplish, and how did it impact the lives of the people that were closest to Jesus? Well, we're going to continue working through the first part of the book of Acts together after uh, beginning next Sunday. And so I'd love to encourage you and invite you to come on back to that. Now, friends, for almost 2,000 years, Christians have gathered together on Easter Sunday and celebrated the risen King Jesus. For 2,000 years, I want you to realize that's a really long time. There's no kingdom, no country, no empire that was on the earth at the time of Jesus' resurrection that is still here today, and yet the church of Jesus Christ, his people, gather and worship the risen King Jesus every single year. In fact, conservative estimates say that there are 2.6 billion other Christians worshiping Jesus today and celebrating the risen King Jesus along with us. You know, it's not an overstatement to say that today, Easter Sunday, is the most significant day in all of human history. So what I'd like to do with you this morning is actually jump right into John's gospel and read for you John's account of the resurrection of Jesus that's found in John chapter 20, verses 1 through 8. It says this, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. So actually at this point in the story, Mary believes, and so do the other disciples, that Jesus' body has been stolen, not resurrected. And so Mary goes and gives this word to Peter and John, and they take off to investigate these claims. Now, before I read for you the next verse, I just want to tell you, when I read Scripture, especially the Gospel of John, I see a lot of humor in John's writing. Humor that sometimes we might miss out on because of the amount of time that's passed since these things were written or because it was lost in translation. But I see a lot of humor, especially when it comes to John and Peter's relationship. Their relationship together is so playful and so much fun. You may be able to relate to this today. And so I want to jump in and continue reading. So now Mary's come and John and Peter are going to take off to the tomb to discover what's really happened. And it says, so Peter and the other disciple, that's John speaking about himself, started off for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. So John wants us all to know, John wants everyone for all time to know who's going to read his gospel that in a foot race that he is faster than Peter. He wants us to know this very important detail, which is actually completely unnecessary to the story. But the Holy Spirit allowed him to put it into the gospel. And so it goes on. It says, John, who's the fastest one, he gets there first. And it says, he bent over and looked at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, mentions it for the third time. Just just in case you missed it, first two, one more. I got there first. So now John also went inside, and he saw and he believed. See, once John goes inside and he surveys the scene, what he realizes immediately is that if Jesus' body had been stolen like they thought, If grave robbers had come and taken Jesus' body, then why are the grave clothes still there? Why would they unwrap him and leave the grave clothes behind? And why would they do it with such care? Why would they be folded and left lying in their place if somebody came and stole the body? So John is the first person who believes in the resurrection of Jesus without first seeing Jesus for himself. 
Now, what I did today in preparation is I started reading the uh, resurrection accounts in Matthew and Mark and Luke and in John. And I just kept reading through them over the last couple of months and praying and really trying to decide what God would have me share with you all today. And I just love this for the first time. Now, this is my 10th year of full-time ministry here at Silver Creek Fellowship. And I just love that for the first time, I noticed a detail that for some reason I hadn't noticed before. For the first time, I noticed that the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, who are led by the Holy Spirit to write down their accounts, give the vast majority of their time and their details of what happened on the day of the resurrection, not to the resurrection itself, but to what happens next. Not to the resurrection details himself, but to something else. In fact, they begin to turn their focus on who Jesus begins appearing to to the people that Jesus starts to appear to. In fact, the Gospels are going to show us at least five appearances of Jesus on Resurrection Sunday, and then at least ten more over the time period before he ascends into heaven. And I think what these appearances show us is something really important, and so maybe you are at the end of your attention span already, so I'm going to give you the whole message in one life point right off the top, and then we'll break this down. But here it is. It's Jesus is still appearing to people. Jesus is still appearing to people. He just can't help it. He's still reaching out to people. In fact, I had this funny thought this week. I was thinking about if I was Jesus, it's very good for all of us that I'm not, if I was Jesus and I had died and rose again from the dead, who would I want to appear to first? If I was Jesus and I died and rose from the dead, who would I appear to first? And I asked a lot of people this question this week. And my wife, who's much, much holier than I am, had a really good answer. She said, I would want to go and see my mom, Mary, because the last thing she had seen was me dying on the cross and being crucified. And I'd want her to know that I was all right. Well, my first thought was that I would like to go and visit Pilate. <clears throat> I would like to go and show up to appear in the palace of Pilate past his guards and say, hey, Pilate, you should have listened to your wife. <laughs> Remember, she had tried two times to warn Pilate not to have Jesus crucified. I'd love to just appear and say, hey, Pilate, Claudia was right, and then just disappear. I think that would be so much fun. Another thought I had was I would love to appear to the religious leaders. I would love to appear in the inner part of the temple, in the Holy of Holies, where the curtain once divided the most holy sections of the temple. It now is lying there on the ground. And I can just picture Caiaphas and the other high priests that were all gathered around thinking, what are we going to do about this curtain? And I would love to just bend Jesus and appear and say, what do you think this is all about? What do you think this could mean? And then just disappear and leave them with that. But the good news for us is I'm not Jesus, and he doesn't do things the way that I would do things. So let's go back to the Gospel of John, because John is actually going to highlight three individuals that Jesus is going to appear to after his resurrection. And I think we can learn a ton from looking at the lives of these people that Jesus decided to appear to. And so here's the first one. If you're a note taker, this will be there in your note sheet. And the first one is this. He appears first to brokenhearted Mary. His very first appearance is to broken-hearted Mary. In fact, we learn that Mary, who rushed to tell John and Peter that Jesus' body had been stolen, when they, they literally raced back to the tomb and she's following them, and then they race away from the tomb and she's still left there by herself. She's still left there at the tomb, and this is what it says. Verse, chapter 20, verse 11, it says, Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. Mary's brokenhearted. Mary is grieving. And friends, I just want to stop right here for a second. And I want to speak to every person who's come here today, who deep down in your soul, you are hurting. Deep down in your soul, you are carrying a wound. And if you're like most people, you got up this morning, you put on your happy face, you got ready for, to come to church for Easter, and most people probably think you're doing great. But the truth is, you find yourself really hurting and dealing with some real difficult wounds. Maybe it's from your marriage. Maybe it's from your lack of a marriage. 
Maybe it's because of your health. Maybe it's because of your mental health. Maybe it's because of someone you love's mental health. But you find yourself struggling today. Well, here's what the Bible tells us. It tells us that while Mary was weeping, in fact, listen, we'll go on. It says, as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realize that it was Jesus. See, as she wept, as she was in her moment of despair, that someone had stolen Jesus, taken her Lord, that someone is doing this terrible thing to someone she loved so much, in this moment of grief, she turns around. And Mary is able to experience the very first appearance of Jesus after his resurrection. It wasn't to one of the 12 disciples. It wasn't to someone in power. It wasn't to someone in authority. It was to someone grieving. It was to someone crying. And in her grief, she still didn't realize it was Jesus. And friends, I've been in so many situations with grieving, hurting people. Given the job that I do, I'm often with people in some of the darkest moments of their life in real pain, in real difficulty. But friends, the Bible has a specific promise for you today. It says this in Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and He saves those who are crushed in spirit. You see, God is actually, according to this, He's drawn to, He's close to. He's drawn to people who are broken. He's drawn to people who are hurting and who are grieving. And the first person, he could have appeared to anyone. He had all the options of who he could have appeared to, and I had a few suggestions for him. He could have appeared to any one of those, but who did he choose? He chose brokenhearted Mary, because the Bible teaches us that Jesus is drawn, God is drawn to those who are brokenhearted so that he can save those who are crushed in spirit. Friends, when you are going through something difficult, when you are suffering, when you are in pain, I promise you, I promise you that Jesus is near. The Bible says that Jesus is near to those who are brokenhearted. And friends, I just want to encourage you to look for Jesus in the midst of your struggle, in the midst of your pain. Look for Jesus because he will be there. The first appearance to Mary reminds us of this truth. Jesus isn't as far away as you think. Jesus isn't as far away as you think. In fact, let's go on with the story and see what happens. Verse 15, he asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I'll go get him. Jesus said to her, now listen to this, so beautiful, Mary. Jesus calls her out by name. In her grief, in her brokenness, Jesus calls her out by name. And in that instant, She knows that voice. She's been with Jesus, and so it says she turned around, she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. In this moment, in her grief and in her pain, Jesus speaks her name, and everything changes. Her grief turns to joy because she gets to experience, the first one to experience the resurrected Jesus. Now let's look at the second individual that the Bible highlights, that Jesus appeared to after the resurrection. And this is a name that even if you're not a church person, or even if you didn't grow up in church, you're probably familiar with this name. Number two, we're going to look at Doubting Thomas. Poor Thomas. He has this attached to his name, all because he doubted for, the, for this one time and forever. He's become this idiom for anyone who doubts anything. Oh, you are just the Doubting Thomas. And that morning, after Jesus appeared to Mary, next John is going to tell us about that evening when Jesus is going to appear to his disciples for the very first time. But when Jesus shows up to meet with his disciples, we're told that Thomas wasn't there. Now, I've got some guesses why. Why would Thomas be the only one not there? And my guess is because Thomas is feeling pretty disappointed with the way things have turned out. They're scared. We're going to learn that in just a minute. And I think they're probably thinking like, boy, we've wasted the last three years. We were wrong. We thought this guy was the Messiah, and we were wrong. 
And now our lives are ruined. So let's read about this account in John 20, verse 19, it starts. It says, on the evening of the first day of the week, so it's Sunday night, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, they are behind closed locked doors because they are convinced that they're next. The same guys who just arrested Jesus are coming for them. So they're behind closed doors. And I just love what the Bible says happened next. Put yourself in the room. They just watched, they just, Jesus was just crucified and, and killed such a horrific scene. They're behind locked doors, trembling in fear, and it says Jesus came and stood among them, came through the locked door, appeared, and now if you put yourself in the room, I think the next line is quite humorous because Jesus said, peace be with you. I would say so. Can you imagine the startling uh, effect that Jesus just appearing after being dead into the middle of a locked room would have had on his disciples? He says, peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Now let's skip down to verse 24. It says, now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the 12 was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciple told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. See, Thomas wants to see for himself. Thomas refuses to believe the testimony of his friends. He wants some physical proof for himself. Now, friends, again, I noticed something in this that I don't know why I never noticed before. I've always given Thomas such a hard time about the way that uh, he responded in this situation. But did you notice what it said in verse 20 that we read just a moment ago? When Jesus first appeared to his disciples that evening, the night that Thomas was not there, it says this, he showed them his hands, and his side. Jesus had actually shown up to the other disciples and he had shown them his hands and his side. All the other disciples had the opportunity to see for themselves that Jesus was indeed alive, that he had been physically raised from the dead, that he wasn't just a detached spirit or a ghost, but that his body had been resurrected. And listen to me, friends, this is so important that you get this. Jesus isn't turned away by your doubts. Your doubts will not keep Jesus away because he loves you so much. He loved Thomas so much that what you're going to see is he's going to intentionally go back seeking out Thomas for a second time. Chapter 20, verse 26, the Gospel of John. A week later, his disciples were in the house again. And Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Now look what he does. He's going to go straight for Thomas. Straight for Thomas. He says, Then he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Jesus comes to Thomas right where he's at. He comes to Thomas in his doubt, and he shows up and says, Okay, Thomas, you asked for this. You want to see my hands? Here they are. You want to see my side? Here it is. But then he asks Thomas to do something. He asks the doubter to take a step. He shows him his hands and his side, and he says, I want you now to reach out and touch me. I want you to take a step and come towards me. And when Thomas does, friends, verse 28 says, Thomas said to him, now listen to this statement, friends. He says, my Lord and my God. In this moment, Thomas has a radical knowledge of who Jesus really is. And I would say to you and every person in this room that's struggling with doubt, If you've come into this room today and you said, man, I'm here, I showed up, I did my duty, but I really don't know about all of this. I really don't know about this Jesus stuff. I mean, I just haven't made my mind up yet. What I would ask you to do is do the same thing Thomas did, and that is just reach out. Because Jesus is very much here today. And if you would be willing to just reach out, you would experience, just as Thomas did, the risen King Jesus, our Lord and our God, in a very real way. See, Jesus' appearance to Thomas shows us this. 
Jesus isn't bothered by your doubts. Jesus isn't bothered by your doubts. Jesus is still inviting you and I to come. Jesus is still inviting us to experience him for ourselves. Psalm 34, 8 says it like this. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. This is an invitation to us, friends, to experience for ourselves the tangible goodness of God. Friends, I'm not asking you to blindly believe or just take my word for it. I'm inviting you the way that Scripture invites you to reach out and experience for yourself that indeed God is alive and that He is good and that He is willing to reach you and to touch you and to change your life. This is the good news of Easter. Our God is alive, so you don't have to just take my word for it. If He's really alive, if he really is who he says he was, then guess what? He's available for you to experience today. Here's the third one I want to look at. Maybe my favorite one um, of Jesus' appearances. And it just shows us really Jesus' heart so well. And that's number three. Jesus is appearing to the failure Peter. The failure Peter. The end of Holy Week had gone really, really bad for Peter. I mean like terrible bad. On Thursday night at the Last Supper, Jesus is talking about dying, laying down his life. And Peter tells Jesus in front of all the disciples, Jesus, I will never let you down. I will never betray you. I would die for you. I'm ready to fight for you. You can count on me. And Jesus actually says to Peter in Mark 14, verse 30, Truly I tell you, Peter, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And then stubborn Peter, which I relate to so well, stubborn Peter doubles down on his declaration and actually corrects Jesus. Verse 31, but Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. But turns out, Jesus was right, as always. And Peter does betray and disown Jesus that very night. In fact, Peter's betrayal goes really far. Maybe you never noticed this. In Mark chapter 14, verse 71, it says that his denials went so far as to, he began to call down curses and swore to them. I don't know this man you're talking about. Swearing oaths and calling down curses, yikes. That's pretty intense language. And in real time, the Bible tells us, as he's swearing these oaths and calling down curses, in real time, Luke 22, verse 60 says, just as Peter was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. And Peter remembered the words the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and he wept bitterly. See, Peter is heartbroken by his failure. And his response is much like our response to failure. He immediately starts to run away. He immediately goes away and hides. In fact, I just love this in Mark's gospel. When the angel shows up at the tomb and talks to Mary, when when the angel tells Mary to go tell the disciples, it says this little added detail. Listen to this, verse 7. It says, go tell the disciples and Peter. And Peter. Well, Peter was one of the disciples. Why did the angel need to add an and Peter? Well, I think the angel knew that unless Peter was specifically invited to come, he was not going to show up because he would have felt like he was disqualified. He would have felt like because of his, his betrayal, because of his uh, shame, that he was no longer welcome. Now the angel tells the disciples to all go back to the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus is going to come and he's going to meet them there. So the disciples obey and they go back to the Sea of Galilee. But it's interesting what they do when they get back. Peter is really the leader of this group. And when he gets back home, what does Peter do? John 21 verse 3. I'm going to go out to fish. Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. 
Now, I just want to tell you, some of you are like, yeah, I get that. If, you know, I'd like to go out and fish too. This is not the type of fishing they're talking about. You're going to discover here in a minute that they're going out all night long with the nets and they're going to fish without catching anything. And I don't know about you, but fishing all through the night without catching anything with nets is probably not something they were doing recreationally. Okay, so Peter decides he is going to, because of his shame, because of what he's done, I'm going to go back and do the thing I know how to do. I need a win. I'm going to go back to the life that I know. My dad did it. My grandpa did it. And I'm going back to become a fisherman. But I love God's humor once again. Verse 3 says, so they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Now, verse 4. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples didn't realize it was Jesus. See, Jesus, friends, is coming for Peter. Verse 5, he called to them, friends, haven't you any fish? Now, in the original language, actually, the question Jesus asked assumes a negative answer. So what he's saying is, you don't have any fish, do you? And I just love the Bible answer. Verse 5, no. They fished all night. They've caught nothing. You don't have any fish, do you? No. Verse 6. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. Now, some of you hear that story and you say, hey, I'm familiar with that. I remember that story. They fished all night but caught no fishies. They threw the net over the other side of the boat and they caught a bunch of fish. I'm familiar with this story. And I want to tell you, friends, that actually this miracle is unique because it actually happens twice. This miracle happens twice. It happens once in Luke chapter 5 at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. And do you remember specifically in Luke chapter 5 when this miracle took place who Jesus was calling to be his disciple? Peter. The first time this miracle took place, it was the day that Jesus called Peter to follow him. And do you remember how Peter responded to the miracle? Luke chapter 5, verse 8. It says, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. And do you remember how Jesus responded to Peter? He said, no, Peter, actually... I came for you. I want you to follow me. I'm going to teach you a new way of fishing. I'm going to teach you how to fish for men. Come, Peter, follow me. I'm here to call you. And I don't want you to miss this moment. In the middle of Peter's greatest moment of failure, in the middle of Peter's uh, just turning his back on the Lord, what does Jesus do? He recreates the very same miracle that he used to call Peter to follow him in the first place. Jesus recreates this moment of connection with Peter, as a way to say to Peter, Peter, I'm here for you. I know you're a sinner. I knew that when I called you the first time. But I still chose you, Peter. In fact, we can see how the disciples respond to this miracle. John chapter 21, verse 7, it says, Then John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, said to Peter, this is, It's the Lord. This is for you, Peter. Jesus is calling you, Peter. And friends, I'm telling you, it's the same for you today. How does Jesus treat you when you mess up? How does Jesus treat you when you fail? Is he harsh? Does he yell at you? Because some of you think that. Some of you think that Jesus is incredibly, you hear this voice of condemnation in your mind, maybe words that were spoken to you by your family when you were growing up, and you think that's how Jesus treats you. But Jesus isn't like that. He's so kind. Look what he does for Peter. He recreates the same miracle that he used to call him in the very beginning just to let Peter know, Peter, my plan for you is still in place. The door for you is still wide open. Peter, I chose you for a reason. And Peter, I've made a way for you. And Peter does something next that I'm hoping some of you will do today. Peter does something next that was the best decision of his life. He stops running away from God and starts moving towards him. John 21, 7. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and he jumped into the water. I love that. Peter immediately starts, without any hesitation, moving towards Jesus. Jesus is so kind. He comes and he reinstates Peter in such a loving, kind way. You can read about it there in the Gospel of John. 
And what Peter and what Jesus' appearance to Peter shows us is this. Jesus isn't giving up on you. Jesus is not giving up on you. Now, friends, whenever I mention this and whenever I talk about this, there's always somebody that right now in your mind, and your heart, you're starting to think, yes, but you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've seen. You don't know what I've said. You don't know what's happened to me. And friends, you need to understand this. This is so important for us. So often you're thinking, how can God just dismiss what I've done? How can he just wave his wand and make it all better? And friends, that's not what Jesus does. Why was Jesus able to be so gracious towards Peter? Why is Jesus able to be so gracious towards you? Because Jesus doesn't just dismiss our sin. He pays for it himself. See, Jesus was able to show Peter this kind of grace because Jesus himself had paid the price for Peter's sin. Jesus himself knowing every sin that Peter would ever commit, had called Peter to follow him and then laid down his own life so that Peter and you and I could experience forgiveness so that we could become friends of God. This is the good news of the gospel. We're told in the book of Romans, Paul wrote in chapter 5, verse 6, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemies. We will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. This is what Easter is all about. Jesus has restored our relationship with the Father. Band, you guys can come back up. I want to finish this up. And today, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, because Jesus is alive, we can now live a life, the life that God dreamed for us. We can live God's purpose and plan for our life. We can experience God's dream for our life. We can live lives that are fruitful, that are a blessing to this world. Because remember what I said back at the very beginning, point number one that you could check out after I said it was this, Jesus is still making appearances. Actually, let me show you something. Some of the very last words spoken by Jesus as recorded in Scripture. About 60 years after Jesus rose from the dead, this disciple whom Jesus loved, the Apostle John, had a vision of heaven, had a vision of times that were to come. And in that vision, Jesus meets with him and he speaks to him. And some of the last words of Jesus recorded in the uh, book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 20, are this. I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. See, this is Jesus' invitation to us today. He's still making appearances. Because Jesus is alive and he's conquered death and the grave, he now, the reason that we are still here on earth and that we are not yet on the other side of eternity is because he's not yet done seeking and saving the lost. He's still reaching out to us. The Bible says he's knocking on the door to your heart. But friends, here's what I've experienced. Our lives are noisy. Intentionally so, in fact. Because often when we quiet ourselves and we quiet our mind and we quiet our heart, there's lots of other voices that we hear and we're uncomfortable with that. And so we seek to fill our lives with noise. But friends, I would tell you today that if you would be like Thomas you would be willing to reach out, if you would be like Mary, 
And when you hear your name called, you would turn around. If you would be like Peter, when you recognize the Lord is there, that you would jump out of the boat. What you would experience today is that God's knocking on your heart is a very real thing. And that God wants you to know that He's real. That God wants you to know that He's alive. That God wants you to know that He loves you. That He has a plan for your life. And so all I'm asking you to do is give just a couple of seconds and quiet your heart and your mind long enough that you can hear the Lord knocking. That you can sense that Jesus, the King of Kings, is actually right here, right now. That His Spirit is at work amongst us and in us. That He brought you here today. You thought you were coming to make your mom happy, but you're here. You're here because Jesus wanted to tell you this. That He loves you. That He died for you. That He has a plan for your life. So I just encourage you, reach out to Him. Be willing to say, Jesus, I want to know you better. Because he'll reveal himself to you, friend. That's Easter Sunday. And Easter Sunday is a Sunday that we celebrate. Easter Sunday is a Sunday that we get loud and we celebrate because this good news is so good. It affects every other part of our life. And so we can't close Easter Sunday service with a go in peace and serve the Lord and a down song. We've got to celebrate, okay? So what I'm going to ask you to do is we're going to stand together one more time. We're going to sing and we're going to celebrate and we're going to thank Jesus that he's alive and that that changes everything.
Lord, we are so grateful. It seems like so often we just don't have enough words to speak. And so the ones that we have in our language are just to say thank you. Thank you that you rose from the dead. Thank you that you're alive and well. Thank you that you're seated on your throne right now. Thank you that you're for us and not against us. Thank you that you've forgiven our sin and separated as far as the east is from the west. Thank you that you are still showing up, that you're still making appearances, that you're still calling people by name, that you're still helping those in doubt, that you're still helping those who fail, that Jesus, you are still moving in our midst. We thank you and we praise you in your perfect name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Happy Easter, friends. Now you have a job to do. You have to take your kids home with you. And you got to do that and clear the parking lot because we've got a third service to do coming up at 11 o'clock. So go in peace and serve the Lord.